This is Detective Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain a biographical drama film called Charlie Says, which is based on the real events surrounding the Manson family cult. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. There's no point trying to understand how the devil works or trying to find him in your day-to-day -day life. He doesn't appear in a crimson cape and pointed horns. No, the devil appears as all you've ever desired. Lulu, Katie, and Sadie are incarcerated in the Special Security Unit of the California Institution for Women. They're put on death row, but since the death penalty was lifted, no one knows what to do with them, and the governor doesn't want them to join the general population. Since the warden can't just let them rot there, she tasks UC graduate student Carlene Faith to teach the three some classes. Surprisingly, Lulu, Katie, and Sadie are nice, polite, and joyful. They spend their days behind bars singing and joking around with the guard. But what unsettles Carlene is their clear devotion to a certain Charlie's teachings. Their belief systems have been shaped wholly by that man, and they even let him give them new names, which is what they like to go by now. Seeing just how misguided these women are, the once reluctant Carlene resolves to reverse this. Lulu's indoctrination began when Bobby and Catherine brought her to an idyllic ranch on the far side of Los Angeles. At the time, Lulu was known by her real name, Leslie, and she seemed excited to meet new people there. Immediately, she's greeted by other members who told her that Charlie said that it's not a day for working, so they were all just being today. Lulu was then taken to meet the smooth-talking, charismatic leader of the Manson family, Charlie Manson. Disheveled as Charlie was, the man had an air of freedom and self-assurance to him, one that pulled Lulu straight in. Everybody in their little family loved Charlie and were charmed by his guitar playing, his playfully unpredictable gestures, and his laxly magnetic manner of speaking and making promises. And from the looks of it, Lulu was falling for Charlie's mythos, hook, line, and sinker. Katie was assigned to be Lulu's mentor, and she taught her all about Charlie and the family's views. She explained that they, as members of the Manson family, follow Charlie's advice to let go of their egos, experience life, and be open to their desires. While showing Lulu around, they met Tex, and she told her that he's still working on letting go of his ego. Eventually, they saw the ranch's owner being openly pleasured by a woman. Katie noted that they don't get hung up on lovemaking, they just be and let things happen. They even came across Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys as he's visiting the ranch for communion. Everyone's given drugs, and with that, they headed over to the mountains. Later that night, the family was around a campfire, listening to Charlie drone on about how parents love dictating what their children should do. And in return, those children got cookie-cutter minds. He used Sandy as an example, calling her spoiled before asking her to undress. Sandy was clearly shaken up, but she didn't say or do anything even as Charlie called for the other woman to undress her. And when Sandy was nude, he showed off the surgical scars on her back and asked the group if her parents truly loved her, then why did they let the doctors cut her up? Charlie kept repeating that Sandy was beautiful and that everything was her parents' fault. Finally, he instructed everyone there to call her beautiful. And while the women were approaching Sandy to hold her and affirm her, Sandy finally started smiling as she cried, especially when Charlie went to kiss her feet. While Lulu watched everything unfold, she couldn't help but get emotional as she found it all so beautiful. Returning to the present, Lulu tells Carlene that Charlie owns everything and that all girls deserve a daddy like him. Of course, Carlene is skeptical about this, and she wholly believes that Lulu, Katie, and Sadie have all been brainwashed. She offers them some books, but Katie claims that authors are evil and they manipulate their readers' thinking. Carlene grows increasingly alarmed by the women's behavior. They haven't seen Charlie in three years, but all they do is talk about him and preach his lessons. She tries reaching out to other teachers to help the three, but they would rather teach actual victims, not murderers. In another memory, Lulu discovered that the women weren't allowed to serve themselves food until all the men at the table had done so. Charlie stressed that the members of his family are all attempting to let go of their materialistic lifestyle, to surrender, and to lose their egos and hang-ups. But in order for them to exist in the present, he reminded everyone that there must be some self-death. Later, Charlie explained that they're trying to live in their bodies, and in order to achieve that, they touch each other and make love all night long. A moment later, he told the group that Tex doesn't know how to work his tongue, and for the Manson family leader, that's a mortal sin. So he called Catherine over to the front and made Tex eat out her no-no square while giving him some quality instructions. 
But after a while, Lulu caught Charlie disregarding the pain of a crying family member, spurring her to go outside with Charlie following her. He didn't want Lulu to worry, so he pulled all the stops to convince her that what they're doing is giving in and letting go of their self-esteem. Of course, he also drove the point home that they're all about love. Charlie brought Lulu into his room, acting sweet for her and turning her around before asking Lulu what she disliked about her physique. He used the opportunity to make her realize that her flaws are perfect, and with that, he started banging her. While shoving his way into Lulu, Charlie told her that this is just like making love to her papa, which is something that all girls want but can never have. Returning to the present, Carlene, Lulu, Katie, and Sadie discussed the book that Carlene lent them. Despite the vile things they did, the three are saddened by the book and sympathize with all women who have been victims of domestic violence. Carlene is relieved to learn that their heart is still there and that she was able to speak with them genuinely. Similarly, Carlene's also heard stories of the Manson family before their crimes, when everything for them was all about love. In another flashback, Mary gave birth to her baby at the ranch, and it was like a traditional birth surrounded by women, with Charlie helping deliver the child. When Charlie stood up naked in an outdoor bathtub in front of her, she was unimpressed. He continued his typical spiel about parents and Kay was having none of it. Instead, she sarcastically remarked that her father taught her not to take crap from men like him. And just like that, Charlie's veneer of control and dominance started to crack. Though he's the one who kept telling everyone to let go of their ego, he couldn't accept that a woman managed to see through him easily, so he drove her away. Back in present day, Lulu, Katie, and Sadie tell Carlene about how Charlie said that they'll wait out the revolution in a bottomless pit. Then, when it's finished, some of them will transform into winged elves and fly to the surface. Though Carlene is incredulous, she deals with the matter politely as she tells them that what they're thinking of is impossible. When they try to reason out that Charlie says, Carlene cuts them off, asking them what they think. The three of them are clearly taken aback when she asked that. In another flashback, Lulu called her mother to tell her that she has another family. And despite her mother's crying, Lulu insisted that she needed her mother to stop loving her. Happy with her decision, she joined the other girls and while they're talking, Lulu brought up her past. The others disapproved of this, saying that they don't have past since their lives began with Charlie. When Lulu countered that Charlie talks about his time in prison, Katie snaps at her, asking how dare she question Charlie before adding that she should say less and listen more. The mood shifted when Dennis arrived, and the girls joyfully welcomed him. While Charlie's playing the guitar, Dennis informed him that he managed to talk to his band into recording Charlie's song, Cease to Exist, since everyone loved it. Overjoyed, Charlie started playing again while mumbling about how he'll be a rock star. Later on, he happily told everyone that Dennis's producer will be listening to him sing, so he wants to wear a deerskin top. But since killing was against Charlie's word, Lulu pointed out that they have to kill a deer for his top. This had Charlie hostile and he told Lulu that she had a tiny female brain and that if she thought he was contradicting his words, then she wasn't evolved enough to understand what's going on. Confused, Lulu was left speechless. But when the time came for Charlie to perform in front of her record producer, Terry Melcher, Terry wasn't impressed at all. Charlie was so furious over the rejection that he broke everything in the back of their barn, including his guitar. In his anger, he even got violent with Sadie after she made a silly comment in dinner. The poor girl was badly hurt from getting beaten by him, but when Lulu asked if she was okay, Sadie just responded that getting hit by the man you love is no different from making love to him. Her words worried Lulu. At this point, it's clear that Charlie's a fraud. His larger-than-life ego remained shattered, just like his dreams of becoming a rock star. Fueled by his vicious resentment, his sermons became angrier as he switched from music to violence. The group listened to him as he hatched up a plan where he'll start a race war by murdering white people and blaming it on black people. He asserted that an apocalyptic war called Helter Skelter will emerge due to the racial tensions, and he'll be there to guide his family to the bottomless pit, where they'll live out the battle underground. Back in the present, Carlene brings a colleague with her so they can learn more about Charlie's planned race war. After they point out how deeply xenophobic Charlie was, Lulu grows troubled and confused. She starts crying that night as she suspects that all of Charlie's beliefs are wrong and that Helter Skelter won't come at all but Katie urges her to keep believing in Charlie's ideas. Eventually, the girls are informed that they'll be staying in the special security unit for the rest of their sentences. They're terribly devastated by the news, but Lulu tries to remain positive. Katie then says that Lulu must hate her since she's the reason why Lulu's there, but Lulu promises that she can never hate her. 
The next day, Carlene plans on surprising the girls by letting them rest and have a mini concert. But when she enters the foyer, Carlene is astounded to see that Lulu, Katie, and Sadie have all shaved their heads clean. They keep claiming that Charlie spoke to them and made them do this in protest. And Carlene feels heartbroken to see just how deeply entrenched Charlie's manipulation and brainwashing are in these girls. In another flashback, Lulu ended up sleeping with an attractive biker named Steve, who had taken quite a liking to her. But when Charlie saw them sleeping together in the barn, he was furious. He snapped at her, asserting that she shouldn't just sleep around, she needs to ask him first. And with that, he forbade her from having visitors unless they went through him first. At some point, Charlie also started leading his followers to break into rich people's houses at night. Their aim was to scare them by messing with the furniture, stealing their wallet, and letting them know that they weren't safe. The following morning, Steve and his group were in front of Charlie's house again. He's worried that Charlie's making Lulu stay there against her will, so he offered to take her away. Lulu had a worried look on her as she looked towards Charlie, who seemed unconcerned while he was listening to them. In the end, Lulu hesitantly declined Steve's invitation, and no convincing on his end changed her mind. Steve looked dead straight at Charlie, who still remained unfazed by him, before parting ways with her. After Steve and his gang left, Charlie took Lulu on a ride out into the woods. Upon reaching the edge of a cliff, he explained that if she wanted to leave him, then she should jump. As Charlie pointed to the cliff's edge, Lulu was struck with the perplexing and horrifying realization that there was no way out of the family. In the present, Carlene shares with the warden that if she succeeds in making the girls realize what they did, then they will have to live with that horror every day for the rest of their lives. In turn, the warden tells her that this is what prison's for, atonement. In another memory, Tex returned to the family. After quitting and being away from the ranch for a while, he realized that he didn't belong outside, where fraudulent people existed. He belonged there with the family, where he can serve Charlie. Pleased, Charlie started riling his followers up to fight, making them chant who's the piggy repeatedly until they crescendoed into vicious chants about killing the piggy. After going on about scaring the piggy into willing them all of his money, he asked Tex if he was willing to die for him, if he's willing to let Charlie kill him. The violent and manic energy of the Manson family members was palpable, and Tex wholeheartedly announced that he will die for Charlie, and they went into chanting, We can kill you, you can kill me, again and again. Later that night, an irate Charlie headed to Terry Melcher's place, since the man wouldn't talk to him on the phone. When he arrived, he met the actress Sharon Tate, and celebrity hairstylist Jay Sebring. She informed Charlie that Terry's not at the party since he's relocated to Malibu already. Sharon invited Charlie to come inside, but he declined and instead he stared at her lecherously as he bid her goodnight. Charlie then ordered Sadie and Tex to go to Terry's house, which he now knew was being occupied by Sharon Tate. And with the devil-given purpose and swagger of an unhinged megalomaniac, he announced that it was time for the Helter Skelter. To see the operation through, Katie and Linda accompanied Sadie and Tex to Terry's house. While driving, Tex talks about an acid run he and Mary did a few weeks back. They took a drug called Orange Sunshine, which made him think that he was invisible. He became even more convinced when he recalled Charlie's teachings and realized that the closer the sun got to set, the closer he knew that the world was coming to an end. When they arrived at Terry's residences, the Manson family members operated like clockwork. They murdered everyone including Sharon Tate and Jay Sebring, and the killing spree was carried out by Tex, Katie, and Sadie. Meanwhile, Linda begged for her life with a horrified look on her face as if she had backed out at the last minute. A split second later, Tex killed Linda without even an ounce of hesitation. The next day, Katie told Lulu about the murders, and she was sobbing as she recalled what Charlie said. If you love everything, you don't have to worry about things. Still, Katie's unsure of her feelings, so she sought Lulu's wisdom. Lulu agreed that it's okay and continued to ask her what it was like to kill people. Katie admitted that it didn't seem right, but Charlie asked her to do it, so it must have been the proper thing to do. She believed what Charlie told them about life and death being synonymous, so she really shouldn't be afraid. Lulu could only look at Katie in awe, and she ended up agreeing with everything she said. Later that night, Charlie gave Katie the order to murder another family, but he reminded her that it shouldn't be as sloppy as the Tate murder scene. And with Lulu wanting to accompany Katie, Charlie agreed and let her in on the operation. In the LaBianca household, Tex handled Leno LaBianca, while Katie and Lulu made their way up to the bedroom. There, they came upon Lino's wife, Rosemary, and the woman immediately grabbed the lamp and swung it to keep the girls away from her. In turn, Katie fought Rosemary with a knife, 
leaving Lulu terrified. In her fright, she entered a room which had a painting hanging on the wall. As she focused on that single image, she became dazed and deaf to the victim's horrific screams. With that, the Manson family members succeeded in murdering Leno and Rosemary LaBianca in the name of their fruitless apocalyptic race war. When Lulu regained consciousness, she was shivering in terror. She returned to the bedroom and saw Tex all covered in blood. Suddenly, Katie grabbed Lulu and told her she needed to prove herself. In the end, Lulu stabbed Rosemary over a dozen times. Her face was splashed with blood, and it contorted in a furious wrath and existential exhaustion with each plunge. After all that said and done, Carlene is right. The girls eventually understand the gravity of what they did. And when they finally understood it, Lulu realizes that they killed for nothing. All those deaths didn't bring a revolution. They were all for nothing. And she, Katie, and Sadie have to live with the rest of their lives knowing that they have blood on their hands. Eventually, the three of them were released into the general population at the California Institute for Women. In the late 70s, Katie finally renounced Charlie Manson. She accepted that everything she had believed was now wrong and that so many lives were shattered by the path of destruction that they were a part of, and it all came from a simple thing as wanting to be love. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.